Greg, I think you've been muted as soon as we started the recording. Look at that. Okay, so welcome everyone. Uh, you might want to check your layout button up in the top corner and um, you can change the, the view a little bit to make it easier to, to see things. And uh, I'm going to introduce our two speakers today. We've got uh, Nick Snavely from Minnesota DNR and Matt Frazier from the Leech Lake um, Natural Resource Department. So guys, why don't you say hello to the people and we can get started with our program. I think your guys are muted. Yeah. Hi, this is Nicholas Snavely, the Assistant Area Wildlife Manager with the Minnesota DNR based out of the Sauk Rapids DNR office. Hello, everybody. My name is Matt Fraser. I'm a Leech Lake Tribe member. And like they said, I work for the uh, Div uh, Division of Resource Management for the Leech Lake Band. Well, okay. thanks, everyone. Unless there's anything else, I'll get going. All right, so thanks everyone for joining us and uh, your interest in learning how to uh, harvest wild rice uh, in Minnesota. Uh, today we will cover various topics, but th that is our main focus um, with some coverage of other items. Uh, so this is really a, a welcome to new and returning wild rice harvesters. Um, you've likely joined us today because of your own similar interest in harvesting your own wild rice uh, while enjoying the peacefulness of gliding across the surface of a shallow lake or river covered in a covered by wild rice. Uh, we hope you find this webinar on wild rice har harvesting helpful uh, in starting your own journey and developing a passion for, and respect for the Minnesota's official state grain, uh, one of our most tasty and native uh, wild edibles. Just a quick introduction about my history with wild rice. Um, starting early in my career working with my coworkers uh, as part of the DNR, uh, to restore and enhance wetland basins, I participated in wild rice management uh, that included wild rice seeding and water level management to benefit uh, wildlife. Uh, so here you'll see my coworkers seeding wild rice, and then 10 years later, what the result of that effort was uh, with rice spread across the wetland basin. As from those experiences, I developed a strong interest in learning more about wild rice um, and how it was harvested for these seeding projects, and have now harvested up to about 15 years. Uh, learning through trial and error on my own, um, as well as working uh, with other folks that know the way. Uh, I've learned a lot since my first time harvesting wild rice uh, with my fellow, my wife, and I hope you'll learn enough today to be confident to start your own wild rice harvesting journey with your partner. So our focus today will be on how to harvest wild rice. Um, here are some related questions you might uh, may have um, or be asking yourself about you know, harvesting wild rice uh, that we'll try to answer. You know, why, why we harvest wild rice in the first place? Uh, where do you find wild rice? Uh, how and when to harvest wild rice? What are wild rice harvest regulations? What equipment do you need? Uh, and what, uh, you know, what are you going to do with that rice after you collect it? So uh, we had a presentation previously uh, presented by Ann Geisen, a uh, wildlife lake specialist with the Minnesota DNR that covered wild rice ecology and management in a previous webinar. You can find her uh, webinar presentation on the DNR webpage uh, using the information here. It is a YouTube video to watch, so check it out when you get a chance. Knowing that, I will not be covering that specific topic and focusing more on the harvesting aspect of wild rice. I like to also uh, recognize and thank um, Annette Drews and Ann and Geisen for inviting me to uh, give this presentation on behalf of the DNR. Um, they uh, have been some advocates for wild racing across the state of Minnesota and uh, management, and it's been great to get to know them over the years. So let's start our journey together, hearing personal accounts about why uh, wild racers harvested uh, what is commonly called uh, northern wild rice or Manulman, uh, which is also uh, known by its scientific name as Zinnia palustris. Various introductions to wild rice harvesting um, quotes of, of, you know, folks have come into it uh, from various ways, you know, from, from family members, others were introduced by friends, um, and others just tried it on their own, uh, similar to how I had come to know wild rice harvesting. Um, gatherers of wild rice uh, started at various ages. Um, a DNR survey that was conducted, um, you know, had an average of 31 years old, and then another survey 
uh, conducted by Annette Drews and others uh, showed that you know, tribal member age um, started around age 15, whereas non-tribal members were around 23 with an average age of around 20, uh, ranging from as early as age six to as late as 58. So, you know, wild rice harvesters, you know, they like to be outside as this person indicated, you know, being out in the woods on the lake, it's fun to get rice. And there's always, there's always, there's always a, an opportunity to give it to people as gifts. And that's the type and that type of thing. Um, another individual indicated I'd rather harvest wild rice and have it have that as a staple in my diet versus buying potatoes or something from the store. Um, and another individual indicated, you know, my parents rice, it was a supplemental income for them. Back in those days, we didn't save uh, any of it for ourselves. We actually sold it all. So at this time, I'm going to turn over the presentation to Matt. Um, take it away, Matt. All right. Hello again, guys. Um, so I was asked uh, to come in and kind of talk about the cultural importance uh, that Monoman is to the Ojibwe people. Um, and I kind of want to express, you know, that this is my perspective on things. Uh, there are many other tribes and reservations uh, all over the country, but let alone, you know, in Minnesota. Um, each kind of has their own ways to do things, uh, ways to pray, ways to harvest monomen. So this is my perspective on that. Um, but with that being said, I don't got a slide uh, to introduce my introduction to rice. Um, I went ricing as a child. I didn't like it because it was a lot of work and it was hot and uh, a lot of bugs. But I uh, picked it back up when in my mid 20s um and then i've been kind of been avidly going now for seven eight years um and so i've kind of developed a pretty deep connection with the rice uh personally and culturally um so why is it important to the ojibwe people um you know the ojibwe people have this sense of place and where is this place and where did it begin? Um, so there's a migration story. My ancestors were historically from the Northeast um, and it was prophesized that we were told to go where the food grows on water. And so the great migration began across uh, the Great Lakes region and we did find that area and it's all throughout the Great Lakes region, but we're here in northern Minnesota, you know, the farthest length it took on that migration story. Um, so, you know, the, the importance behind that is uh, it's literally the reason that we're here in our sense of place. Um, and so it's been significant food source for generation as a long tradition. Uh, wild rice hand harvesting by tribal members and non-tribal tribal members alike. Um, the culturally significant and highly nutritious food has been used historically. And also a trade item in the 1680s and the eight, uh, to six, 1860s, sorry. Um, the various tribes throughout Minnesota have their uh, own rules and regulations on uh, harvesting, uh, selling and buying and who can and can't rice. And so when you're talking about the importance uh, to the culture, um, we can look take a look at this quote. It's this profound and historic relationship that is remembered in the wild rice harvest, a food that is uniquely ours, a food used in our daily lives and our ceremonies and our feasts. It's a quote from the great Winona LaDuke uh, that really stands out. You know, it's it, a lot, that's, there's a lot of truth to that. Um, and then, you know, culturally speaking, um, just like anything that we use and take from this earth, uh, personally, I was taught to offer a SEMA, which is tobacco. Um, and like I said before, uh, everyone may do it a little different, um, but to offer a same, uh, some do it at the land, some do it at the landing, some do it by a tree. Uh, me personally, 
I will uh, go out on the water to be with the rice as I offer my asema. Um, there's no wrong way to do it, but as long as you do it in a good way. Um, but the important thing is to offer that asema before uh, taking the rice, starting to, starting the harvest. Um, and after the offering, um, we'll begin our day and kind of go about it as just as any other ricer does. Um, one of the more important things that I've learned from my peers and coworkers and just any ricers out there was that we treat Monomen as if it's one of us, as if it's a family man member or a provider. Um, and how do, how do we treat them? We treat them with respect because they provide for us and we need to provide for them. So, you know, how, would, how do we do that? We take precautions in how we move throughout the uh, rice beds um, so as not to damage the rice. Um, how to harvest it if we're, we're not supposed to be harvesting what's called green rice. Um, and the the rice will come to you when it's ready to fall off those rice heads. If you're out there thrashing the rice, uh, there's been times where you know we, you've heard elders getting mad because they can hear the thrashing of the rice. And if you're thrashing it, you're you're putting too much into it and damaging the rice. Things like that. You learn these things, um, and it's just passed down from people. So the main the main thing there is just the respect of the rice. You treat it as you would a family member. Um, and to me personally, ricing is uh, I would compare it to a Sunday sermon. Um, when I'm out there, I kind of feel connected with my culture and spirituality, and I feel connected with uh, those ancestors who did make that great trek from many miles from the northeast um and that's why that's a big reason why i rice because i want to keep that connection going for seven generations down the road um so we look here at the mississippi river headwaters the beginning of the the mighty mississippi and there's wild rice here um, and on the upper rice lake harvesters Plenty of lakes and rivers around here within the reservation borders that are have a significant amount of rice. And so we'll move into wild rice harvest regulations uh, because, like I mentioned earlier, the tribes uh, can manage the rice on their own. Uh, we have sovereignty here to do that. So it's managed a little bit different. Uh, each tribe can set their own rules and regulations their harvest method, methods, uh, when they open the rice beds, the hours. Um, and I'll go into Leech Lakes in a little bit here. <clears throat> and so when you combine uh, the cultural importance and the, um, the research today with the state, we got the tribal and state collaboration for monitoring wild rice, and it's funded through the Legislative Citizen Commission on Minnesota Resources. And harvesting monomen is a climate adaptation strategy, <clears throat> excuse me, funded through the National Ocean. Oh, something good. Um, so throughout the state of Minnesota, uh, each, like I said, each tribe can set their rules and regulations. Um, all native wild rice within the existing boundaries of the White Earth, Leech Lake, Boise Fort, Grand Portage, Fond du Lac, Mille Lacs tribal reservations are managed uh, by their respective um, their committees. Ours is called the Natural Resource Advisory Committee on Leech Lake here. And those are the ones who do set those hours and open dates and regulations. Um, and they let them let the state know 24 hours when they're going to be opening because sometimes we will uh, run it where we have kind of a Monday, Wednesday, Friday thing so as the rice can kind of rebound and be uh, better for harvesting. Um, these regulations may be altered by the rice committees after the season has been announced by posting the major entrances to affected waters no less than 12 hours prior to the change taking effect. 
So it is unlawful for any person to take wild rice grain from any of the waters within the original boundaries of the White Earth, Leech Lake, Net Lake, Vermilion Lake, Grand Portage, Fond du Lac, and Mille Lacs reservations, except for Native Americans or residents of the reservation upon which said wild rice grain is taken. And so going back to Leech Lake, all non-tribal members must have uh, Leech Lake reservation permits to harvest or bio, buy wild rice within the boundaries of the Leech Lake reservation. <clears throat> and so the picture on the left here is Mud Lake. That's one of our larger uh, lakes containing rice. And then to the side here, we have uh, two other large contributors. There is uh, Nature's Lake and Rice Lake. And the red line you see there is the Leech Lake Reservation boundary to the north is the state side. And the state uh, opens up earlier than the reservation side does. So as you can see, there's um, kind of a, there's not a definitive boundary there out on the lake. So it has to be monitored pretty closely uh, where you can and cannot harvest, uh, you know, according to when we want to open our beds. Uh, there's a couple more lakes like that on the reservation boundary, but this is a kind of a big example right there. <clears throat> and then this was kind of a big one. Um, there was protests going on in 2016 uh, for people within the ceded uh, territory to not need a license to uh, to harvest rice. Um, we had coworkers go down there to. Uh, protest and and as, as, as a result uh, tribal members who possess a valid tribal ID card from a federally recognized tribe located in Minnesota are deemed to have a license to harvest wild rice and do not need the additional state wild rice harvesting license so what that means is we can be anywhere in the state of Minnesota with just our tribal ID and have the ability to rice so, um, but that uh, I'm going to kind of show you guys quickly what a flail is or what we call a knocker. These are typically made out of cedar. They're very lightweight and this is what we push the uh, rice onto the into our canoes with. Um, just kind of wanted to show you the size and kind of length of those quick here. And then that leash lake also we sell our rice uh, here at the DRM. In these packages, it's Leech Lake is kind of the rising capital of the world, uh, as I call it. Um, but, you know, with that, I'd like to hand it back to Nicholas. Thanks, Matt. I really appreciate you taking the time to uh, be here and, and help cover that uh, information for us all. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the Minnesota wild rice harvesting license requirements uh, for Minnesota residents and non-residents. All harvesters uh, must be licensed unless they're under age 18 and are accompanied by a licensed harvester uh, while out on a wild rice bed. Um, you can purchase your uh, license from an electronic license system or EOS for short, typically where they sell um, small game uh, deer hunting and fishing licenses. Um, or you can also buy it on the DNR webpage. They have an online uh, uh, site for that as well. Uh, fees from the wild rice harvest and buyer licenses are deposited in a special account for wild rice management uh, that Ann Geisen had discussed during the last webinar on the topic. Uh, Minnesota residents may purchase either a season license uh, for $25 uh, called the wild rice harvester license, uh, or you can uh, get a one day license as a resident uh, for $15. And then other, otherwise, uh, you know, if you're a non-resident, you can come into Minnesota and also wild rice. Uh, the the charge for that is $30. Those prices do not include the extra uh, $1 agent fee that's uh, charged uh, based on where you buy your license. So where do you find wild rice? Uh, it's found in streams, rivers, marshes, lakes. Uh, they're typically uh, part of a river system, uh, mostly in a water that's a half a foot to three feet deep. Uh, sites with flowing water are great uh, and preferred by wild rice. And you know, wild rice is pollinated. Um, it's a shell rooted annual grass, um, actually, a grass. Um, so, this is a grass seed that you're actually consuming, not a rice, actually. Um, and it seeds every year by itself. Um, Minnesota has more natural wild rice than any other state in the nation. And, uh, you know, approximately 2,100 lakes and rivers across Minnesota have it, as shown in this map with the green dots. Um, it's most abundant in uh, northeast Minnesota, especially in 
Aiken, uh, Cass, Crow Wing, Itasca, and St. Louis counties. Uh, so when you look at the spatial distribution of wild rice, um, you're going to see that where people buy licenses is pretty typically where the rice is at in the state. You know, when you look at this 2006 map, um, at that time, over 80% of the ricers um, or harvesters were 80 or were a male, um, and the average age at that time was 48. Um, so you know, once again, the most frequented um, Minnesota wild rice uh, harvested water bodies in Minnesota are shown here. Um, they ranked one to ten. Um, so if you're looking for a place to go, this this might be a, a place to look. Um, this is part of our 2007 uh, survey that was done on Minnesota uh, natural uh, Minnesota wild rice harvesters um, and the study that's put out and uh, published on the Minnesota DNR wild rice page. So. You know, there are some areas that are restricted where you can't harvest rice um, unless you have a special permit. So, in, the, in this case, national parks and national wilder refuges are closed uh, with, unless you have a permit um, from them. Uh, however, you know, wild rice uh, can be harvested on state wildlife management areas, um, except where they're actually specifically closed by, uh, you know, sign posting or by rule. And you'll find that information in the back of the uh, Minnesota Hunting and Trapping Regulation Handbook underneath wildlife management areas. They'll uh, note which WMAs might have a, a closed wild rice basin to harvest. So wild rice really is an important resource in Minnesota. It's important to waterfall and other wildlife. Uh, provides the food, the habitats, uh, the cover that they need. Um, and, you know, even the invertebrates that grow on wild rice stocks are really important to these uh, migrating waterfall as they stock up on the nutrients and the uh, calories they need to be able to make that great migration uh, up in uh, north and south, especially south. Um, so the season dates and hours for wild rice harvesting in Minnesota are August 15th uh, to September 30th, daily from 9 to 3. Uh, throughout Minnesota's wild rice season, you know, even though it opens up on August 15th, the rice might not actually be ripe yet, um, so it can't be legally harvested. Um, so, you know, at that point, it's uh, typically maybe still be green rice, uh, they call it. Um, so, in general, wild rice is ready to harvest when it shatters easily from the stem. Um, so, the peak wild rice season, typically that last week of August, um, the first two weeks of September is the time to really consider going out uh, on a wild rice bed. Uh, do some scouting ahead of time. Um, you'll be able to utilize that information as well as other resources to find out maybe where a, a basin might be ready to be harvested. Uh, seeds on a single plant don't all harvest or ripen at the same time. So that allows you to come back weeks, you know, maybe a week or two uh, and still continue to harvest wild rice from that basin. Uh, wild rice is often ready to be harvested uh, when the tops start to tip over more with all that extra weight in the seed heads. Um, you know, scouting beforehand, like I mentioned, is really important. Um, if you can't do it yourself because you live hours away from a wild rice bed, you know, I hope you find a good contact to work with and uh, have them provide the information you might need so that you can make the trip uh, north or south, depending on where you're at in the state, and uh, harvest some wild rice. Um, harvest of green, unripe wild rice is unlawful. And so what is green rice? Green rice uh, is defined as, you know, any wild rice that contains more than 15% of grain still in the milk. I said 15% uh, is determined by volume. So that's pretty specific. But if you take a, a grain uh, or, a, a, you know, a piece of wild rice seed and you're out on a wild rice bed and you're doing some scouting, um, if you snap it in half and look at the milky stage, um, if it's really got that milky uh, look to it and it doesn't look like it's firmed up more into a starch, um, it's probably well in that stage where it's not ready to be harvested yet. Uh, wild rice production uh, will vary from one year to the next. Uh, typically, you know, over a five-year period, you'll have one good year, one really bad year, and maybe a couple average years. Um, and each stand can be affected by water fluctuations from one year to the next as well. From rain events or wind events, uh, they can really wipe out a, an entire stand. You know, here in 2004, shown here, great stand, not a lot of issues with the water level fluctuations to that stand. But in 2016, there was a, a major weather event that, you know, wiped out the stand during its folding leaf stage, which is a, little, a month or two earlier than uh, when the stand to, uh, to the left is shown. So. So individual season um, harvest totals vary from one basin to the other. Um, as shown here, you know, some harvesters will go out for multiple days and collect a lot of wild rice. Um, and they, 
some basins have larger kernel sizes versus others. Um, that could be uh, you know, river rice might look different than state um, uh, lake rice. Uh, average individual season uh, harvest for uh, for folks throughout the season, at least during this uh, survey that was done, was about 512 pounds, uh, with a range of as little as 30 pounds to up to 2,000 pounds. Um, however, keep in mind that you know less than half the harvesters gather less than 300 pounds of wild rice in an entire season. Expect some variability on uh, your water accesses uh, due to weather events. Um, sometimes you have a drought like last year and you can get on a lake fairly easily like this one here. Uh, whereas, you know, in 2012, it was completely flooded out and uh, getting to the dock that actually gets you out to the lake uh, might be very difficult. So you might need to have some uh, you know, sandals or rubber boots on or something to get out to that spot before getting wet feet. Um, wild rice harvesting equipment, you know, Typically, what you're going to have is a canoe, um, and you're going to be in that canoe with a push puller. Uh, you're going to have two people. Uh, one's going to be pushing with the pole, and the other one is going to be using the flails to knock that wild rice into the canoe using a quick uh, swipe of the arm and wrist, um, kind of doing a sweeping motion more than anything else, not so much a knocking motion typically, because uh, you're just looking to take the rice off the seed head uh, that it will easily fall off. Push poles uh, used to propel, propel watercraft harvesting, uh, while you're harvesting, uh, must be forked. Uh, have a duck bill, I guess you could call, call it, and uh, at the end, and it can't be any longer than 12 inches for each fork. So um, you can see here, uh, the pole that goes into this uh, flail is about an inch and a quarter, and that's the type of pole that you might use if you don't uh, go make one yourself from, say, tamarack, um, a tamarack tree or something similar. Uh, poles usually. Uh, prefer to be 18 feet to 20 feet, if at all possible. The, the longer you can have them, the better. Obviously, uh, they're as long as the canoe that you typically transport to the site as well. Uh, keep in mind that if you are a push puller and you feel like you're going to lose your balance, consider jumping completely into the water um, and not taking the canoe over with you. Um, you know, losing your balance and then also losing all the wild rice that you collected up to that point um, is kind of a hard thing to swallow. So. Uh, take the time to uh, clear the, the canoe if you're going to have to jump in if you're really losing your balance. And that'll happen. Uh, it happened to me when I first went out uh, starting to wild rice. I think I jumped in the water at least three times that um, that day. And I had a, a plenty of uh, wild rice harvesters around me. Uh, put on a great show for them. Uh, but it was it was nice and warm water and, and it didn't bother me at all. So I also learned how to crawl back into a canoe while on open water. So another reason to make sure you're wearing a life preserver. Um, you know, you never know if you clear the canoe completely and knock your head or something like that. So just make sure you do it safely and uh, have that preserver on. Uh, bag your wild rice uh, during the harvest. Um, you know, if you do tip your canoe, um, you want to make sure you don't lose the entire load of rice that you've harvested up to that point. And so usually what I'll do is about two hours in, I'll, I'll take a break with my partner and um, maybe grab a snack and then we'll throw whatever wild rice we have into a bag, tie it off and throw it up into the uh, front part of the canoe um, that I'm pulling towards. And, uh, you know, sometimes I'll get the flail as well, but uh, it really depends on your partner and what their strengths and weaknesses are and versus flailing versus uh, push pulling. Uh, but that way you can put your uh, wild rice, I guess, in the bank, if you, per se, and uh, not worry about if you do tip the canoe in the future, you know, how are you gonna get all your wild rice back? Um, if it's all still in seed form, freely flowing in the water, uh, you've essentially lost it if you tip the canoe. Whereas if it's in a bay, you can easily pull it out of the water, toss it back in a canoe and, and be on your way. Uh, so yeah, bake that wild rice as you go. Um, you can tip the canoe as well, you know, just sitting there in open water. You know, if you find a place that you wanna take a break, maybe uh, put your canoe in some wild rice uh, with stocks holding the canoe on both sides, to provide a little bit more balance. And, uh, you know, be aware that at any time your canoe might go over. So best to have it bagged uh, when you have a chance. Flails uh, used for harvesting, and when it comes to regulations for them, must be round, smooth, and no longer than 30 inches, and weigh no more than a pound. Uh, flails must be handheld and operated. Uh, this is not a mechanical operation, you know, with the push pull or or the flailing action. So you can see here in the upper right photo, um, this individual has uh, wild rice that they're pulling uh, as the push pull is pushing them forward uh, through the rice. They're pulling the rice to the side over the canoe, not necessarily down into the canoe, but just over, and then using the second uh, flail to kind of put a flick in 
uh, with the flick of the wrist. So just a quick flick. So pulling over and then flicking. Um, I've learned that you don't necessarily even have to go downward into the canoe, just straight forward um, from the base of the head of the, the um, wild rice uh, seed to the tip with a nice flick and it'll come off if it's ripe. Practice makes perfect. You're going to switch back and forth. You're going to pull one from one side, flick, and then come over to the other side with your other hand and flick. So you're going to go back and forth if you have wild rice on both sides of your canoe that you can harvest. Uh, sometimes the rice with the wind will lay over the canoe nicely from one side and not so nicely from the other. And that's the side you'll, you'll favor the whole time during that time. But other times you'll continue to maybe do it from both. Um, Matt alluded to, uh, you know, push pulling through wild rice. Uh, try to make straight long paths um, if at all possible uh, you know, parallel to each other and when you get to the end of your pass either you know try to make a pass so that you're in open water so you can turn around and come back so you're not uh, smashing down the wild rice that you're trying to harvest whales are often made from uh, white cedar and so it's it's that whitest uh, most durable wood available for making knockers and uh, most harvesters have different preferences in their size uh, shape them to fit your hand size and make sure they're, they're no larger or no, weigh no more than a pound. Uh, using flailing sticks or knockers as your partner pushes through the um, wild rice bed to move the canoe. Um, as I mentioned, you know, you're going to bend that rice over and then uh, f gently sweep it off and into your canoe. Uh, typically, the canoe orientation, as you see in this picture, is actually backwards. Um, if you look at a, a tandem canoe, uh, when it's typically paddled, um, as you can see in the, this picture, the, the back of the canoe has a seat right up against the rear of the canoe. So there's no space for the puller to stand. So if you take the canoe and orientate it uh, backwards and push it through the race that way, you have a place for the puller to stand and then have a place for the flailer to sit in front of that front seat, I guess you could call it, but with the canoe turned backwards. Uh, so here's another example of that um, you can see the, the polar has plenty of room they're going to take a surfing stance i guess you could say one foot in the back and then one foot forward like you're surfing on a surfboard uh, but using a canoe instead and uh, you're going to push through the rice the canoe itself or the watercraft can't be more than uh, 18 feet in length and it has to be uh, less than or equal to 36 inches in width um, so Keep that in mind. Uh, if you, make sure you measure your canoe that you might have at home and, and make sure it meets the specs if you're going to use it on a wild rice basin. Um, any extension that increases uh, the normal capacity is prohibited. Uh, watercraft used for harvesting wild rice are exempt from needing to be licensed. So if you're a duck hunter, you'll notice that uh, those also don't need to be uh, uh, licensed and the same applies for wild rice harvesting. Um, you know, keep in mind, we don't want to spread aquatic invasive species um, on the equipment that we use, in this case, a canoe or any other thing that you know, we might bring with us. And so make sure you clean your, your watercraft uh, before and after you leave the site. Um, it's the law and it's the right thing to do. Any person violating the laws and rules pertaining to wild rice is subject to a fine up to $1,000 and 90 days in jail. Um, so. Uh, follow the rules, you'll be just fine and, and, you know, be aware of where you can and cannot rice by checking in with different resources we'll cover later. Uh, if you ever do have ratchet straps uh, to carry your canoe, I, I, I prefer them. Um, they seem to tighten down nicely, but just make sure you don't over tighten them because you might uh, strip your attachment points. Um, an extra push pole, I usually travel with at least two. Uh, that I bring to the sites and might leave one back by the vehicle um, unless I have a collapsible one I can throw on the canoe. Uh, with me you probably saw earlier that i actually had two paddles in the canoe as well you know if if a pole breaks while you're out on the wild rice bed um, having paddles or an extendable push pole that you can uh, you know, utilize to get back to the landing is pretty important so don't travel without them um, and make sure you have an extra one if you need it um, you know, safety is always important with wild rice harvesting you know having a wild brim wide brimmed hat and safety glasses with side shields and that life preserver are critically important um, you can see I have my shoe uh, held up here. It's got a bunch of ons of wild rice sticking out of it. You know, having the proper footwear and maybe duct taping off your your pants to your your shoes or footwear is important to you. I'd say it's probably more so for the individual that's flailing the wild rice into the canoe. Uh, the push puller, not so much right in the rice, um, but uh, you still you might get wet feet in the back because you're pulling the uh, pull forward and backward into the water and that drips water 
into the canoe near the rear of the canoe as you're uh, uh, push pulling. And you might actually get your partner a little bit wet depending on where they're sitting. Um, if they're not far enough forward uh, as your pole is dripping into the canoe slightly, uh, you bring some water in that way as well, uh, potentially on their back. Um, you know, wild racing really builds character. Uh, there are some side effects, if you want to call it that, uh, challenges. Uh, wild race ons are itchy. Uh, wear the appropriate clothes with tight uh, fabric weave uh, to reduce the uncomfortable experience. You know, if bugs are not your thing, you know, face your fears. Uh, you're going to harvest this uh, wonderful natural uh, food source in Minnesota, but you need to prepare accordingly uh, by using either a neck gaiter or a leg gaiter, you know, similar to what folks use for cross country skiing in the wintertime. Um, you know, you can use duct tape in a pinch if you need it, uh, but that'll all um, prevent rice worms or rice jumpers, spiders, and ladybugs from crawling up your pant legs, uh, as well as wild rice on uh, going down your shirt and maybe getting into your belly button. I've heard of folks uh, actually duct taping off their belly button. I've never done it myself, but uh, uh, you know, to each his own, I guess. Um, also, some folks will uh, put cotton in their their ear canal just to keep wild rice ants from getting in there as well. I, I try to make sure that you know I, I have a a nice conversation with my partner. But if you're down flailing rice, uh, sometimes you might not want to be talking as much with your mouth open because you can get uh, a flailed wild rice on down your throat and that's not fun to deal with. So uh, be aware of that as well. The abundance of uh, natural nutritious food that you can take pride in when you gather uh, rice yourself um, and provide yourself a healthy diet for you and your family and friends and relatives that you might give the rice to is is great. And that's uh, the side effect of you know vitality. Um, I, you know, I've strengthened a lot of relationships with my coworkers and friends that I brought out over the years, uh, introducing them to wild rice harvesting. Uh, it is a shared effort though. Um, you need to communicate with your partner and see what they prefer you do if you're a push puller or the flailer so that you are in, in a rhythm together. Uh, when you're not chatting with your partner, uh, sometimes racing can get to be a, a long day. Um, so, you know, I encourage you know, having those nice conversations to, you know, have some personal time in the wild rice bed. But those silent moments do count. Um, a great time to watch the natural environment around you and, and see uh, you know, wildlife such as soar rails, blue-winged teal, wood ducks, and the like get up from the wild rice bed, and you probably see a pair of trumpeter swans while you're out there as well. And, you know, it's a great opportunity also to, you know, have a cultural appreciation uh, for the wild rice heritage uh, passed down for many generations here in Minnesota and other states. Um, you know, that's now entrusted in you as a wild rice harvester, and you should sit, share it with someone else if you can. Finally, uh, you know, when it comes to building characters, you know, having stamina, um, you know, it's it's pretty rough go if you, if you have to do it all by yourself and you had no partner. Um, but if you do have a partner, you have the opportunity to switch spots. Um, so I always encourage you to do that, you know, maybe every two hours or so, because uh, there are some repetitive motions that cause sore muscles. Uh, you know, switching roles is important to prevent aching and cramp, cramped muscles uh, and excessive blisters that you might get on your hands or you're rubbing on your arms from your sleeves passing over wild rice. So that's another reminder, you know, try to wear a long sleeve shirt, especially if you're um, you know, flailing rice into the canoe uh, because your arms and shoulders might be rubbing up against the uh, the rice and having a pair of gloves on is really nice to have. Do a mental check every once in a while when you're flailing and push pulling. You know, are you being as efficient as you can be? Um, are you still talking to your partner? Um, six hours is a long time to go uh, wild racing, especially if you don't take any breaks. And so, uh, you know, every push pull counts, every flail counts if you're really into it for production. But if it's just to, to have a good time, then that might not be as, as strong a concern. But find your rhythm and, uh, you know, consider it might take about a half hour to cross a wild rice bed with every pass. So, depending on how big the basin is. So, uh, here's the canoe paddles I was talking about. Uh, you know, in the ba base of that canoe, you start to throw uh, or flail some wild rice seed in the base of your canoe, and then you start to hear that nice resonant ting sound off the metal. It's, it's a it's a sound that I uh, really enjoy when I first get out there. And then that sound starts to dissipate and uh, you don't really hear it as much. You get to the point where the uh, rice ons actually, instead of laying horizontal on the base of the canoe, start to stick straight up and down. And that's a pretty neat seat, sight as well. Uh, depending on the water body and harvesting day, um, you might get a, a lot like shown in the right picture here uh, or very little. Um, so you really need to do a good scouting ahead of time and talk to your fellow wild rice harvesters to see if they're willing to share with you uh, places to go. 
like I said, bag that rice after you're done harvesting, uh, unload your canoe and sweep it out with a broom. Always good to bring that with as well and then tie off those bags with, uh, you know, a twisty tie uh, or, uh, you know, a, a piece of rope, I should say. Um, you know, that really works well as well as twine. Sometimes folks will use zip ties um, and you can back those off if you know how to do it uh, later when you go out to dry out your rice. Um, Opening buying price uh, of unprocessed wild rice for those that decide they want to sell it um, is often dri driven by our uh, tribal purchases of uh, water accesses. So you might see someone that's willing to buy the unprocessed rice you just collected. And if that's your thing and you, you're looking just to sell it uh, to make some money to help uh, you know, your economic situation with your family, uh, that's an option. Uh, wild rice purchasing prices for buyers have ranged anywhere from 3 to $4 for an unprocessed pound. Um, you know, that might vary depending on where you're at and the amount of rice available from one year to the next. But last year, I heard rumors of, you know, $4 a pound because, yes, there was a lot of wild rice on the basins during the drought year. Uh, but it was just so hard to collect because there was not enough water to float canoes in many of the historically uh, collected wild rice basins. And then if you uh, decide you want to go ahead and process your wild rice uh, into a form that you can actually eat, um, you know, a processor. A professional processor might charge anywhere from a dollar to uh, two dollars and twenty-five cents a pound, you know, give or take. Uh, it really depends on how much wild rice you're bringing them and, and what their minimums might be uh, from you. So, you know, placing bags in your vehicle probably good to throw that tarp in the base uh, to keep it dry. Um, if you if you don't have a pickup truck or something like that, um, you know, you can also place a tarp in the bottom of your canoe if that's your preference. Uh, I typically don't, but you know, whatever works for you. Um, Extra clothing, you know, great to bring that with and put it in the, the vehicle that you have uh, so you can change afterwards. You can see here um, this wild rice partner of mine that I brought out. Um, and she has uh, a bunch of wild rice on her pants and uh, you know, probably is pretty itchy. So, you know, changing into a change of clothes as shown in the right photo here is it's a pretty nice feeling after you've been out there all day and, and maybe worked up a sweat. I'd have to say, though, being on the wild rice bed is, is a pretty neat thing. Um, it's uh, typically I don't I don't think I've ever seen mosquitoes out there, and uh, it's usually just the other bugs that are on the the basin. So you know we're getting close to the my end of my presentation, but I just want to wrap up with a couple slides about processing. Um, I don't want to deal a lot with it, but uh, do know that you need to contact your wild rice processor if you're not going to process it yourself uh, ahead of time. You know, before you even collect that wild rice, schedule with them a date that you're going to bring rice to them. And find out what their minimums might be, you know, they might need a minimum of 300 pounds. And so you might have to gather rice over multiple days or, uh, you know, combine your rice with some other, uh, folks that are collecting wild rice so that you can have them process it. There are devices they use to parch the rice. Uh, usually might need an, a minimum amount of pounds to be able to process it properly. Now, uh, there are some other folks that will process smaller batches, but usually you're going to see a uh, price charged closer to that 225 a pound instead, if that's the case. Um, secure that spot, set that date. All that information is really critical to make sure you know what you can do with your rice after you collect it, because if you don't have that plan in place, uh, you can be in a tight spot after harvesting rice uh, during the season. So if they have those preferences, make sure you know what they are. And then also talk to them, you know, how do they want to receive the rice from you? Do they want it right away um, and not dried at all? Do they want it partially dried? I found that, you know, drying rice at home in the shade for a couple of days and the, uh, when it hasn't rained and it is dry uh, works pretty well. You're going to lose about 10% of your weight doing so, but that's fine because it keeps your rice from spoiling if you just left it in a bag. Those rice bags will heat up pretty quickly, and you want to keep that temperature below 55 degrees Fahrenheit uh, over the length of time that you'll have that rice before you get it to a processor to have them uh, process it into a finished format. Uh, drying in wild rice is shown here, you know, throwing some rocks around the edges, uh, bricks, stones, what have you, to hold it down so the tarp doesn't blow away when you have rice on top of it is important. Uh, and covering it up at night um, or when it might rain, uh, throwing some rocks back on top of it to keep it closed. Keep it nice and dry until you can open it up the next day and before you actually bag it back up again. And, uh, you know, you could probably hang on to rice for five to seven days, typically, maybe a little, little bit longer. Uh, but it would be nice to get it to a processor as soon as possible thereafter uh, so it doesn't spoil on you. Uh, some folks like to air dry it, like mentioned here. Others, uh, you know, if they do it themselves, sometimes they'll actually, uh, you know, wet down the rice with a hose. 
um, and actually you know, keep it at 55 degrees, place those bags on a couple pallets and uh, keep them in a format where they don't get too warm. Uh, and from there, you know, that helps potentially separate the hull of the, the rice on from the seed that it contains. And then when it goes to the parching process, it separates maybe a little easier. Uh, bring your tarp with you. You know, and if you want to, you can you know do a traditional rice camp um, where the entire community helps out uh, and processes their own rice. Uh, but if you do want to do a rice camp where you're not processing it, but you just want to go up north and uh, have a place, or down south for that matter, and have a place to stay for a couple of days, bring a tarp with so you can spread that rice out while you're away from home. Uh, here are some of the basic or the standard uh, traditional methods for finishing rice from the drying process to the parching, you know, turning it over with a canoe or uh, with, with a paddle, um, you know, just stepping out in a jigging fashion, doing a little dance uh, with, in this case, moccasins on, uh, where it helps separate that husk of the hull from the seed and then eventually tossing it up into the wind and letting the, the hulls float away in the wind on a windy day and uh, weaving behind the seed that you can eat. Um, here's the uh, other operation, the mechanical way of doing things where you can parch it um, and eventually go through a threshing machine to remove the hulls and uh, sort it, sort the seed out afterwards. Different methods to do it. Um, I would say most folks, you know, go this route versus processing it themselves, but uh, no way is uh, better than the other. It's just a matter of what you have time to do. So your finished rice uh, after it's been processed from the way it came off the lake to when you actually get it back, say you have 100 pounds, you probably end up with 39 to 45% of that weight. So roughly 39 to 45 pounds. Um, the same goes uh, if you decide to dry that rice um, uh, for a few days and reweigh it, uh, you're going to lose about 10% of the weight. So from that weight uh, until you get the rice back, it's going to be about 45 to 50% of that that dried weight. There's rice recipes out there available. Um, you know, the basic one is to take a, a cup of rice and you know add a couple cups of water. Um, Put it on the stove top and bring it to a boil. You don't need to pre boil the water. Um, adds uh, maybe a tablespoon or so of chicken or vegetable bouillon to taste. Um, and then uh, bring it to a boil, cover it right away after that, and then let it simmer for 40 minutes and it should be done from start to finish. Um, so, any longer than 40 minutes, depending on your stove type, uh, you're probably going to get uh, the rice to open up even more more than you prefer. You can see the rice shown here in the middle is cooked rice. The rice on the right is uh, the um, hand harvested wild rice. It's got more of a, a white tan uh, coloration to it. The rice on the left is patty rice uh, where it's been mechanically uh, harvested uh, either by air boats or flat threshing equipment and actually has been altered somewhat genetically to prevent it from uh, breaking as easily and shattering. So just a quick uh, reminder, uh, the DNR recently came out with, uh, you know, some how-to tips and a, a listserv to sign up for, you know, learning about wild rice harvesting. Um, and there will be some regulation reminders coming out through that listserv. If you decide to sign up, it would give you some season outlook dates and, and uh, tips from area wildlife managers and shell lake specialists, as well as other entities, uh, such as our tribal partners, about what's going on with all things wild rice before and uh, during the season. Uh, so, you know, typically the DNR has put out this uh, wild rice harvesting season outlook uh, from across the state at these different offices and, and even information with from the 1854 tribute, uh, Treaty Authority website, uh, since they also keep track of rice. Uh, online resources are plentiful. Uh, feel free to check those out. Uh, you know, Minnesota regulations are online. The management uh, details are there. The 1854 Treaty Authority webpage is a great resource as well. There's even a Wild Rice Voices Facebook page, and if you do a search for Wild Rice Harvesting, you can learn even more than what I've covered today uh, on your own. So take the time to view those resources when you get a chance. Get your hands-on uh, experience at different places, such as the Wild Rice Monoman Demonstration Camp that's uh, put, typically put on it um, by some tribal partners here uh, in early September. And then also I've seen the North uh, House Folk School put on a, an opportunity as well. Um, you know, you can also just get up by yourself with a partner that you maybe have no one to show you, but if you do have someone that can show you the ropes, um, that's great. Um, having a mentor is, is always a nice thing to have. Jump in, literally figure it out for yourself. Um, but hopefully the tips I've shared with you today are very helpful um, so that you can have a successful harvest. Um, schedule with a partner, 
start figuring out those peak days and you know see when they're available and if, if they're not available maybe you can find someone else to go with you and then uh, you know go over with them you know what kind of equipment they have you have uh, figure out whether or not you got your licenses or, or not yet and uh, be prepared for that outing together I'd just like to thank uh, folks like Annette Drews, uh, the DNR, and Geisen, uh, all those folks that have been uh, advocating for wild rice harvesting and, and management across the state of Minnesota. Um, it's been great to work with our tribal partners as well, and I uh, appreciate everyone doing what they've done over the years to educate uh, the citizens of Minnesota on wild rice. So thank you. I appreciate your time, and uh, yeah, I'll turn it over. Actually done, guys. Um, if you want to shut down your presentation, then when we start answering questions, the pictures will show up nice and Perfect. big. Yeah. All right. There we go. So we've got a few questions that have come in. Uh, one of the earlier ones I answered verbally, but it was the regulation on the size of the rising sticks. That's 30 inches and weighing no more than a pound. Um, so let's go down to the, the first fresh one here. Since wild rice is a grass grain, are there other grasses that are good to eat? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, there's essentially three species of wild rice in Minnesota. Um, I focus mainly on the northern wild rice because um, that's the most common. Uh, the other ones are so few and far between that I, I didn't touch on those today. But uh, uh, beyond that, you know, not an expert in all all things wild grasses, so probably, but uh, I don't have them off the top of my head. Maybe someone else does. Okay. Um, how do you clean your rice yourself? Uh, like I showed on those photos, a lot of those were mine at home. You, you saw my nice, messy backyard and, you know, drying it out on a tarp for a few days, usually two to three days, getting it dry and making sure that, uh, you know, we will allow those uh, invertebrates to crawl away, you know, the rice bugs and the like, um, if you want to call them that. Um, and then, you know, bagging it back up and getting it ready to combine with other folks that I've uh, riced with and, and making the big trip north. Um, I typically have a minimum of 300 pounds that I have to meet with the folks that I uh, combine my rice with if, if I do it all, or or even a thousand if we want a really good price on processing. So something closer to a dollar a pound for processing uh, from a professional processor is likely going to require a larger quantity. Okay. Does the DNR manage wild rice to the point of introducing it into new lakes in Minnesota? Um, you know, we obviously try to restore it to the lakes that are historically been present, but uh, in my active role is uh, in my job, um, I know we've introduced wild rice to basins that we thought historically had, had been uh, potentially present. In. Um, you know, it's been about a 50, 50% success rate with that. I usually try to har or do that seeding over a three year period to see if it takes. And, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of things that we still don't know, but we do know that, you know, basins that have a mucky bottom with some water full term typically do a little bit better with uh, having success for harvest or uh, uh, seeding wild rice basins. Okay. We had a question come into chat. <clears throat> Gina wants to know if the DNR handles filming permits uh, to film ricing. That would be outside my, my scope. <laughs> Okay. We can maybe uh, check into that and um, see what we can find out. So we got a few minutes left here. If anybody's got uh, a question, go ahead and get it turned in and we can ask our, here's another one from Ryan. Um, how is climate change affecting the Monoman wild race? Right. So, you know, it's, it's a, uh... Concern, you know, climate change does have impacts, um, you know, from larger um, rainfall events at one time. That that's really going to drive that water fluctuation of a basin. You know, I, I didn't really talk at all about the wild rice management aspect of things, but uh, that's something that the DNR and our tribal partners also try to manage. Is you know, we're making sure the outlets in a wild rice basin are adequate enough to move water when we have large fluctuations in water. Um, is there a beaver dam? That's been built that uh, might dam up the water and, and prevent uh, that wild rice from persisting because uh, if the wild rice is in a floating leaf stage and it all gets uprooted at the same time. Um, if mm -hmm. the water can't leave that basin fast enough, um, there's the potential that it gets flooded and, and we lose that crop for that year. 
Mm -hmm. uh, Andrew wanted to know if you know of any guides that or outfitters that would um, take first timers out. You know, there are some resources out there um, that I've come across. I don't know if they're still up to date, though. Um, you know, you, you really, you know, reach out to, you know, friends that you might know that rice and you know, find that mentor. Um, and if you don't know anybody, um, you know, you know, reach out to, you know, an area office, I suppose, um, that might uh, do some management. I would say that on the managing realm of things, you know, we don't necessarily have a list of processors. Um, I know Dineen are used to have a list of harvesters as well, but uh, um, it's not currently posted that I'm aware of on the DNR webpage. So when it comes to finding someone to mentor with, um, other than the two camps that I mentioned, um, you know, I, I might suggest you check out those opportunities if you've never wild riced and you don't know someone that does, because those are excellent opportunities to uh, learn in a large group um, and go out for a day harvesting wild rice for the first time if you've never done it before. Mm -hmm. Uh, Randy wants to know what temperature do you need to uh, get to for parching? Oh, uh, I'm not a specialist on parching myself. Uh, I do know an area of wildlife management, a different part of the state that does parch his own wild rice, but uh, I, I don't know off the top of my head that specific number since I, I typically pass that responsibility on to someone else to parch it for me. I, I've tried purchasing in the past, and it's, it's a lot of work for those that uh, are not experts. So I'm still learning myself. Uh, maybe someday I'll take it on, but I have not, so I, I don't know that answer. Mm -hmm. um, Kirsten uh, was wondering if the presentation recorded. Yes, uh, every episode gets recorded. And uh, we have a celebrity amongst us today, Ann Geeson. Uh, Geeson showed up and said, yes, wild rice has been introduced into new basins. So thank you, Ann, for answering that one for us. Um, let's see here. Oh, there are lots of questions coming in. Uh, where can you get a list of processors? I did a quick Google search yesterday and found a bunch out there. So that would be one direction. Is there actually a printed list anywhere? There used to be. Um, I don't believe it's available anymore. Um, Dan might be able to correct me on that, but, uh, um, you know, if you check out some of, uh, like the. 1854 treaty authority they might have something listed uh, but i don't know if there's a published list uh, for process per se that google search might be appropriate or just word of mouth talking to other wild rice process or harvesters and seeing where they bring their rice to susan um the seminars are all recorded um and they're usually available online probably by monday uh, when we get all the closed captioning done um, and her second part was, are there any, are there more detailed instructions on processing rice for yourself? Um, I think you're going to have to do a little more research on that. That might be another show episode that we can do, uh, dive into. Um, there are some great video resources the, out there you can watch if you want to. So check those out if oh, you get you a chance. Can, yeah. And go to a camp, you know, a, a wild rice camp, um, if you can be invited into one or at the demonstration days, uh, they go through that process of processing your own rice. And if you do bring your rice to a, a professional quote unquote processor that does large, large batches, um, you can see how they do it a little differently with the equipment they might have. That's, that's been something that I really enjoyed doing is actually helping them mm -hmm. process my own rice if they if they allow it. Um, what's the traditional version of the duck foot or fork end of the pole and how yeah. is it made? Yeah, um, I didn't cover yeah. that, so it's morally of a fork, but uh, Matt, maybe you want to speak to that? Yeah, so uh, different kinds of woods, so they would uh, find a, a branch that separates. Um, you typically want to get it um, about a foot here, so they would harvest that, cut it off there and section it off here. Um, I've heard of a few different woods being used, um, and actually, on um, there's a lake in Malax that you can only use that type of bill. Um, but yeah, they they just attach it uh, using different methods to the pole versus the more commonly used duck bill. Okay. 
And Anne came back on and told us that she updates the processor list every year. And um, 2022 is not done yet, but uh, send her an email and she can get the, the list to you. Um, Doug wants to know if you can use a small outboard two horsepower to travel to and from the rice bed, not used in the rice bed itself. Is that allowed? If you're not using it to harvest, probably, but uh, I would say most people don't use any kind of motorized equipment and um, you know, might want to have a strong relationship with your local conservation officer or warden that might be uh, enforcing the laws to make sure that they understand what you're doing before they yep. see you out on their bed and maybe take the wrong interpretation. So um, I would say if it was me, I would just go uh, without any motorized uh, transportation if possible. Amber has put uh, Ann's email in the chat. So if you want to jot that down quickly. I want to thank our two guest speakers today. Uh, Matt and Nick did awesome. I uh, found it very entertaining and very informative. So this was episode 68 in our series. And next week we'll be going to episode 69 on paddling basics. So I urge you to come back and uh, check that one out as well. Guys, Matt and Nick, thank you so much for your time today. It was a, a really interesting show. So with that, I think we'll have Amber take us back to the uh, practice room and shut the recording down.